Father God, this morning, we commit the rest of the time to you. Wonderful Spirit of God, you are the counselor. You are the best teacher. Lord, so we ask that you take over this time. Lord, let what has been shared carry your precious anointing and your presence. I ask, Lord, that you hide me behind the cross and let Jesus be exalted. Let only your truth be preached simply and accurately. We ask, Lord, for your grace and your enablement, both the speaker and the hearer, that we can hear accurately from you and we can receive from you this morning. We ask this in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. Praise God. I've spoken some time now in this year about the move of the Holy Spirit. And I believe 2014 will be a year of movement of the Holy Spirit in this church. And it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit will move in your life. We have talked about the anointing, what the anointing does for us, how it feels like when it comes, and how to operate in the anointing. In the coming months, we will look at some of these areas. And one very important truth we have seen from God's Word, we say the anointing is more than just the shaking. The anointing is more than just the trembling. It includes that sometimes, you may feel the warmth and the fire, but it's more than that. We say the anointing, if it's genuine, it changes your heart. God gives you a new heart. God gives Saul a new heart. Say amen. And so I'm so glad this morning the Holy Spirit flowed to the worship and we sing, God, change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. When the anointing is on your life, it will cause you to have a freshness. When the anointing is on your life, you will never be dry. The anointing causes you to be alert, fresh. You will move in revelation. Every time you turn to this Bible, the Word of God comes alive. And there is a warmth and a quickening coming to you. The anointing teaches you. The anointing sparks the passion for Jesus. The anointing envelops you and you feel that warmth of God. When the anointing touches you, you can cry. The anointing touches you, you can worship God and lift your hands. And you don't feel strange lifting your hands. When the anointing touches you, you feel like kneeling. You feel like crying. You feel like lifting up your hands to worship Him. Oh, it's so wonderful to live in the anointing, to walk in the anointing, to preach in the anointing, to sing David in the anointing. When the anointing of God is there, everything makes a difference. There is such a difference. And so in the last days, God is going to teach His people to be so familiar with the anointing. And when you walk into a service, you will know where the anointing is there or the anointing is not there. Where the worship is just because the musicians were gifted to play or it's just a program. But when the anointing is there, it's different. The presence of God will be there. Say Amen. And so we have talked a lot about that already, what the anointing does and how it changes your life and how it cancels your debt and how the, it brings the blessing of God and how the anointing breaks the yoke of Satan. Because the anointing breaks the yoke, your life and my life are no longer under bondages of habits and oppression and depression. For some people, obsession. The anointing breaks the yoke of the enemy over your life and my life. And so we can never overlearn this area because 
This is the age of the Holy Spirit. And so I begin to have shared with you a new sub-area, Keys to the Anointing. So this morning, I'm going to share with you a message. It's in a small little book that I have written, 10 Keys to the Anointing. All right? How many of you would like to know the keys? You like to move in the anointing, sing in the anointing, preach in the anointing. The Bible gives us keys. When Jesus was on earth, turn to the Gospel of Matthew 16, verse 19. It's not in your slide, but just put it up for me, Kelly. Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. A key is a wonderful, small little object. Now listen to what the key does. Jesus used this word. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. You need a key to open a door. All right? You need a little key. It's a small little key. It may be very small, but it can open a giant big door. And when the door opens, what happens? Some of you, a few of you went last weekend to a resort to check out the place you want to have a church camp. And you came back with a good report and you said, Pastor, the banquet room was very nice. The banquet hall was so beautiful, carpeted, and you know. Could you have imagined if you had gone there and whoever who was in charge to bring you there forgot to bring the key, you would not be able to open the door and enjoy and see the luxurious furnishing of that banquet room. So a key, put this in your spirit, a key opens the door to a new realm of space and experience. Say space. You will experience when you walk into the banquet room or you walk into the penthouse or you walk into the luxurious apartment because there was a door and the door now, the doorkeeper has the key and when the key is being applied, it opens the door to an experience of space. And you enter into that space which you could not have entered without the key and you walk on the carpet, you look at the walls and the ceiling and you enjoy an experience. So key brings you to a realm of space and experience in the natural world. But in the spiritual world, you can also, and I can also, enter into a realm of space in the spirit and experience in the spirit. And so Jesus says, therefore, I gave you keys to the kingdom. All right? And so the topic of my message this morning is 10 keys to enjoying or experiencing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The 10 keys. I have spoken the first key last week only and I took a whole week to share the first key that is repentance repentance some of you say pastor that was a powerful message repentance Acts 2 38 Apostle Peter preached the first sermon when the church of Jesus Christ was born he says repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 3 verse 19, he says, Repent and be converted and your sins be blotted out and then you shall experience times of refreshing. That is the Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. And so you cannot experience the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit without repentance in your life. Say, Amen. Amen. You cannot be saved. You cannot experience salvation unless you repent and unless you are converted. And then your sins and my sins be blotted out. Then the Holy Ghost can come here and you will experience times of refreshing. 
How many remember the message? Get the tape, all right? Brother Roger is very busy doing the tape for you. It will be a great blessing. Listen to it again and again. And we say repentance is not one time. Repentance is not just saying the Lord's sinner's prayer when you are born again. Repentance is every day. You cannot say, Pastor, in the year 2000, I repented. I went to that banquet, gospel banquet, and I gave my life to Jesus. And I said, Jesus forgave my sin. Wonderful. The sinner's prayer only puts you on the road to repentance. How could you possibly repent of all your sins if you don't know what they are? Can I hear the Amen. And so as you grow in the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and works in your life and you begin to realize what was okay with you now is not okay. What was alright last time you used to do now, the Holy Spirit touches you and you know it's not alright. And you say, Lord, I repent. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Repentance is every day. Repentance is saying no, no, no to the world. Repentance is saying no, no, no to the flesh. Repentance is saying no, no, no to the devil's temptation. And saying yes, yes, yes to God. Moment by moment, week by week, year by year. As you grow in God, you live a repented life. Say Amen. When the Holy Spirit shows us something wrong, when the Holy Spirit begins to convict your heart, you must and I must be quick to say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I repent. That's repentance every day. I repented last night, but I need to repent again today. If God shows me something I do wrong, I must be quick to say, I'm sorry, Lord. Say amen. That's repentance. Repentance is no longer living the old life. Tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor. Give up your old heart. Come on, tell your neighbor. Give up your whole old heart. Take the new heart. Take the new heart. You see, when John the Baptist came, now I don't know why I'm going back into repentance. John the Baptist came, the people asked him, what must we do? And John says, if you have two, two sets of clothing, just share with somebody who has none. And then the soldiers came to him and said, what must we do? So he told the soldiers, do not bully. Do not use your force to bully. Do not make false accusations. Be content with your wages. Then the tax collector came to him and said, What must we do? He told the tax collector, Don't take more than what is necessary. You know why? Because that was their old life. They used to take more than what is necessary. The soldiers used to bully the peasants. They used to complain about their wages. So what repentance means is what you have been doing before in your old life must not continue. Must not continue. And so John the Baptist says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You may not be a soldier. You, may not, you and I may not be a tax collector. But what you have been doing with your old heart, your own way of life, perhaps you have been Sleeping late, every night watching television, every night serving the computer, and then waking up early, uh, late in the afternoon. What you have been doing before, or perhaps you've been reading the newspaper from cover to cover. You know, I have one week of newspaper I never touch. My wife said, you want me to get rid of it. Some people read the newspaper from cover to cover, but they have no time to read the Bible. They know the names of every football player and every F1 racer, but they can't name the 12 apostles. Whatever it is you have been doing before, before you were born again, if you are a businessman, you've been bribing the customs. Oh, do not say, I say the sinner's prayer and I can continue to do the same thing before. 
John the Baptist says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And so there will be, must be a change. And do not say, I am the son of Abraham. Abraham cannot save you, like Jesus, man. Abraham cannot save you. Do not say, my, my grandfather was a pastor. Do not say, my wife is a holy woman. She prays for me. She goes to church. I'm okay lah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to repent. Repentance. Somebody cannot repent for you. You've got to turn from your sin. That's what repentance is. And it's a process until the day you see Jesus. Are you hearing me? Jesus' last words to the people were Luke chapter 24. He says, Repentance and remission of sin must be preached in my name to all nations. That's the gospel. Repentance. He says, unless you repent, you will die in your sin. That's how serious it is. His last words was, repentance and remission of sin must be preached in my name to all nations. And today pastors come, and today people come and say, don't preach on sin, make people very uncomfortable, you know. There's a dato in our congregation, there's a tansri in our congregation. Just talk something nice and, you know, don't mention sin. I need that talk here. <laughs> oh, there's a tansri here, you know. Don't give an altar call. People crying and all these things. People kneeling down before God. and It's all messy, you know. Just have everything nice, nice, nice. And so the demon sitting in the people also feeling very nice. The demon of greed. The demon of lust. The demon of covetousness. Gripping this businessman. And they say, nice, nice, just come, just come. Just give some money. We love you. God bless you. Repentance and remission of sin, Jesus says, must be preached in my name to all nations. Because one day God will judge the pastors. God will judge the... Sometimes, you know, people think to be a pastor, oh, you, you, you are a leader. But to him, more is given, more is required. One day God is going to judge us for failing to preach the true message. And so we saw that repentance is the key to receive the Holy Spirit, the anointing. I've taken the whole Sunday to talk about that. That's the starting point. If you don't repent, if you don't bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, it's no point, brother, you sing Holy Spirit song. It's no point you sing, Holy Spirit, thou the well come in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power. Satisfy my need. You, play, you can play five times, but nothing's going to happen. How many of you believe God is intelligent? God has intelligence. <laughs> he knows you cannot manipulate Him with your song. You can lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. You sing like it's only from your soul. But if you don't get rid of the sin... And if you don't repent, he's not going to come. Are you catching this? Is this too strong for you? <laughs> Number one, repentance. I didn't say it. Apostle Paul said it. Apostle Peter said it. He says, repent first, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent first and be converted and your sins be blotted out. Then times are refreshing. I've got news for you. Most of the time, when Christians feel they are dry, there's some sin in their life. There's some disobedience in their lives. They are not living right. They cannot worship. They cannot pray. Why? Their conscience condemns them. Yes or no? Jesus says, He who believes in me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. 
And brother, if rivers of living water flows through your life, your life cannot be dry. You'll be wet, wet, wet. Rivers flowing out from you. But you see, sometimes the river is not flowing. It's because their lives are not totally surrendered to God and Jesus is not number one, Jesus is number six. The job and the business is number one. The children is number one. The money is number one. The love of the world, the leave for this world is number one. And that's why they cannot worship God. They cannot pray. They have lost their priorities. And so they cannot. They are dry, brother. But if you want that river to flow again, you make Jesus number one. You take the rubbish out of your life. Say amen. You start repenting. You start surrendering. You start taking those rubbish out, you know. And the river will flow again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you want your river to flow? you got to unclog that river. You know, our Klang River is on the dirty river. When I was in Sarawak, I was in the Renjang River, the longest river in Sarawak, with the pastor in the Sampan. Suddenly, we were going on the river. Suddenly, from far, we see a huge giant log, whole timber log floating down. Man, it can crush you. And then you can see debris flowing down the river everywhere. So when people start dumping dirty things into the river, what will happen? It will clog. Not only it will clog, the river will become dirty and muddy and smelly. Smelly. If you are not a fresh Christian, you have a smell. Come on, do this. If you have the fresh anointing on your life and people fellowship with you, oh, they feel the presence of Jesus. There is a fresh smell about your life. But if you are in the flesh and you are carnal and you are hiding some secret sin and Jesus is not number one and Jesus is number nine, or number six, or number three. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when I'm not your Lord? And when people fellowship with you, you know, they see all your flesh. They smell all the flesh. There's a smell about you. Hello? You can smell the fresh anointing on a Christian. At the same time, you can smell the dirty waters also. But please don't stay away from me. Yes, I'm telling you the truth. But when we start surrendering our life to God and start repenting and walk in all the light we know, there is an openness, there is a joy, there is a freshness. When somebody talks about the things of the Lord, it excites you. Say Amen. You know, sometimes you talk to some Christians, when you talk to them about the Lord, yeah, 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 they're excited, yeah. They're... But when you talk to them about MHP 7 their eyes open. And when you talk to them about making business or starting a new, oh, their eyes open. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus is not number one. Jesus is number three. How many of you want to make Jesus number one? So take the rubbish out. When the rubbish is taken out, the water will flow again. Say Amen. There is a man of God called John Song. John Song was greatly used by God. A man that came from China. He went and evangelized Sitia One. Today you go to Sitia One, there are many Christians, third generation, powerful Christian. Though he died early, John Song was such a great man. He preached, though he was Methodist, he preached lying on the sofa and people cry. People turn the line, give their lives to Jesus. And John Song says this one time, he says, sins are committed one by one. Brother, if you want God to use you, and then he went and he said, sins are committed one by one, you've got to pull it out one by one. And by the time he finished his sermon, he destroyed the flower. The sins are committed one by one. There is the sin. Oh, you're, you're too quick to judge your brother. Come on, confess it, take it out. And he take it out, and he take it out. And by the time it's finished, the flower's gone. But people got the message. Say amen. It doesn't work if you say, Oh, Jesus, please forgive my sin. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. And then go and watch TV. You've got to get on your knees and say, Oh God, what must I do? I, I stay in the place of prayer. And you knew this. Oh God, oh God, you ask God to forgive you a million times until you are satisfied. Until you know for sure that God has forgiven you. And the sin's power has been broken in your life. It does not happen in 30 seconds. Let me understand what I'm saying. There's a phrase that people say, Take time to be holy. There is no substitute for time. This is not my message this morning. First point, repentance. It's the key to the anointing. How many of you want spiritual power? You want spiritual power? That your life can affect others. Your life can affect godliness in other people's lives. When they hear your preaching, when they hear your testimony, when they hear your sharing, their lives are being impacted. That's power. Say Amen. So first key is repentance. Get this, get the tape. The second key this morning I want to share with you is fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Of course, we say the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is the key. And so, many Christians have not learned to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just fire or wind or power. Paul says in these two verses, in Philippians chapter 2 verse 1, he says, if any consolation of Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Holy Spirit, he says this. Then in first or second Corinthians thirteen, the last verse, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can fellowship and have communion with the Holy Spirit. You have communion with Jesus. You talk to Jesus. You talk to the Father. But there is the third person of the Trinity that is on earth today. God gave him to us. Jesus gave him to the church. And when you learn to have fellowship with this person, your life will change and you will grow in the anointing. Fellowship involves a few things. Now, Harris, if I want to know you, do you know that it costs me something to know you? You say, what is that, Pastor? If I really want to know you, it will cost me something. Harris, if I want to know you, I must reach out my hand to you and I must, number one, take time. Time costs you something. It costs you your life. If I invite, I say, Harris, I just want to touch base with you. Now look at them, you're so handsome. If I say, Harris, I want to know you and would you like to have lunch with me today after church? Harris say, oh, wonderful. And so, I take him out for lunch and I sit down with him. It may cost me two hours of my time. And we two hours may run to four hours because Harris then begin to tell me about his life back in Nigeria. And then he tells me about his plan here in Malaysia and about his vision and dream. And so, fellowship involves effort, time, and openness. Put this three key in your life. It involves your time. It involves expanding effort. Not only when I fellowship with you, I... I share with you what the Lord is doing in my life through my ministry, but I also take time to listen to you, what God is putting in your heart and where you are now in your life and what are your visions and dreams for the future. So I need to take time to listen and be engaged. These are the key words of fellowship. Time, effort, 
engage. I need to be engaged with you. I cannot just be passive. Hey, just come for lunch and then, you know, then leave you alone and in the mama store and then I see some other people, I talk to some other people and leave him all alone, drinking his teh tarik. Yes? There need to be focus and engagement and openness. And I've learned one thing, when we open up our lives, people open up to us. It's a natural human response. I start telling you, David, what happened to me last week. Before you know it, you start telling me what happened last week. Try this experiment. Just get somebody to lunch and you start talking what Jesus did for you. And then you will find that they will respond the same thing. You just start telling what happened to you last two weeks in your family. The other person will start telling what happened to them the last two weeks. Natural. 90% of the people respond. And so there need to be an openness. As you open, now this is the art of friendship. I'm sharing both parallel. The art of friendship is first, you have to open your life. When you open your life, you're making yourself vulnerable. Yes? You're sharing your secrets, you're sharing your dreams, you're sharing something. But it's a risk you must take if you want to have an intimate fellowship with somebody. You start sharing about your life, they start sharing about then, I remember when I first came to know David Sia, he came to my house. I'm so appreciative. He started telling me about what God did for him, what he went through in his early days, and how God then uh, helped him and blessed him. And because of the sharing, there is that relationship. It is real in the natural world, and it's also real in the spiritual world with the Holy Spirit. He is the friend. You have to take time. It may be an hour, it may be two hours. If you never talk to the Holy Spirit before, you may feel very strange and say, Holy Spirit, Pastor say, I can talk to you. And so, Holy Spirit, please show yourself to me. Then you wait. Nothing happened also. <laughs> Hello, you have not spoken to the Holy Spirit for the last 30 years and you just expect Him to reveal Himself to you in the next 15 seconds. But you keep trying to do that. Holy Spirit, they say, I can know you. Captain Kumin says, when you know him, he is more real to you than the air you breathe. Why? He's more real to me than my husband. Oh, how can that be, my husband? Honey, do you know me? You can see me, you can feel me, you can touch me. How can the Holy Spirit know me, my me more than my husband. Oh, he can. Do you know why? The, you can only see what is you can only see what is outside. You can't see what is inside. You, you, you can know about David through a certain measure from your experience with him. You live with him for the last 30 years. But the Holy Spirit knows everything about him. He knows the inside and the outside and what he will do under certain situations, how he will react. And so if you know the Holy Spirit, he is more real to you than your wife and your husband. Ah, then I understand. Oh, I see. And so fellowship with the Holy Spirit, time, effort, openness, engagement. These four key terms. You can apply these four key terms in relationship to, in human relationship. Thank you. How many of you want to develop the art of friendship? Yes? Some people say, I know friend one, nobody loves me one. Don't say that. Making friends is an art. Say amen. Yes? You start sharing about your life, you see many people will come and share their life about you, to you. You get engaged with people, people engage themselves with you. You focus, you take time to listen. Everybody loves to have a listener, to listen to them. When, they, when, when you listen to people, many people will flock and tell you many, many things in their lives. You will never run short of friends. Say Amen. And so with the Holy Spirit, but there's one big difference. When you when you fellowship with somebody, Harris, if I want to really have a good friendship with you, I must have respect, 
honor, I respect your viewpoint, I, I listen to you, that's your view. And we all have that in the natural. But when we come with the Holy Spirit, there's a different aspect because the Holy Spirit is not man. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. He is Almighty God. And so there is a similarity and yet there is a difference when you fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Oh, there must be that reverence. There must be that reverence that you must give and acknowledge in your life. When I fellowship with people, I know to what degree sometimes these people reverend God and reverend the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must be given His reverence in your life. The Holy Spirit must be given His uh, right, His rightful place in your life. Let me say this again. The Holy Spirit must be given the reverence in the church and His rightful place in the church. He is the Lord of the church. Say Amen. He is the Lord of the harvest. Amen. He is the guardian of the church today. Where is Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. He has given, He has finished His role. He said, it is finished. And so He has gone to be with God and He has given the church to the Holy Spirit and given the Holy Spirit to the church. And so the church must learn to give Him His rightful place. When the church acknowledges him and say, Holy Spirit, this is your worship service. Holy Spirit, this is not our service. When you go into a cell meeting, when the meeting is about to start, you must have the reverence in your heart. Holy Spirit, you are here. You are the unseen guest. When you walk up to that place to pray, to play, you must not walk up alone. You must say, Holy Spirit, you walk with me. Holy Spirit, this is not my ministry, but your ministry. Say Amen. When the pastor go up and preach, he must say in his heart, Holy Spirit, this is not my message, but your message. As we continually acknowledge and reverence him and give him his rightful place, he will come into your life and he will manifest. Hallelujah. He may not manifest the first time, he may not manifest the second time. But if you constantly look to Him and constantly depend on Him and constantly expect Him, He will come true for you. When you have a decision, you say, Holy Spirit, what must I do? Is this a good proposal? Is this a good man I should link up with? Or is he a slime ball? Is he a slimy character? Holy Spirit will show you. Holy Spirit, what is your mind in this matter? What must I do, Lord? You may not have an answer immediately. Oh, how we wish we have the shortcut way. Holy Spirit, please show me your will. The next minute you open your eyes, you see a vision. Dang, dang. This is the man you should marry. His name is John. <laughs> oh, it doesn't work like that. And I pray, Lord, who should be the head in this ministry? And say, oh, just open your eyes and say, oh, he's the one. And you see the vision. God can do that, but most of the time, he don't work that way. But when you pray, when, from your heart, from your side, there is a constant, continual dependence on the Holy Ghost. Continuing looking to him and say, Holy Spirit, I'm sung without you. You are my everything. You are the secret to my success. You teach me the way to prosper. You give me the wisdom of Jesus Christ. You make me the head and not the tail. I look to you. You constantly have this attitude. And you will see, He opened doors and miraculous things will happen for your life. The attitude must be there. There is a lack of this attitude in the body of Christ. There is a lack of this attitude in the individual Christian. And so we can have our program, we can have our activities, we can have our sermon, we can do everything. It looks like Christian, but the Holy Ghost is not in it. When the Holy Ghost is not in it, that's why people's lives are dry. They are not satisfied. People are not satisfied even when they hear the preaching of the Word of God because the Holy Ghost is not anointing that preaching. Are you hearing me? 
There were times when I just come near to somebody and I said, God wants to touch you and, and just lift your hands and they start to cry and they start to shake and, and the Holy Ghost touched them. It's the Holy Ghost that satisfies us. It's the Holy Ghost that brings His presence in our lives. Say Amen. And so the church, listen to me, the church must give Him His rightful place. Say, how pastor, when you walk through this door, you must acknowledge how many of you have ever spoken to the Holy Spirit the moment you walk through this door. I want to see your hands. None. How many of you, before the service starts, you say, Holy Spirit, please anoint our pastor. Holy Spirit, please speak the word. Holy Spirit, please anoint the worship team. Do you talk to him? Most of the time, the Christians walk through the church door. They just expect everything to be the same. There will be the announcement. There will be some worship songs. The pastor will give a nice sermon and then the benediction and hallelujah, I'll go home. So, you. And so one man of God says this. This is not original with me. One man of God says this. He says, many times, the Holy Spirit, He will come into the church. And his eyes will look for the people. Remember, Holy Spirit is like Jesus. And his eyes look to and fro, and he look, and he look, and he's waiting, and he's looking for anyone who's looking to him. He found none. He waits here at the corner, and he waits here for somebody to say, Holy Spirit, please come, manifest yourself. And he looks, and he sees nobody. And there is the pastor preaching, and there the activity is going on, and there the worship is going on. He comes into the church, he leaves the church with nobody knowing. That's why they don't have miracles in the church. That's why they don't have manifestation of his power. But they have a sermon, they have some Christian songs, they have some worship. Because there were none who was looking for him. So I want to bring a change in mindset here. I want to bring a change in your mindset that we're preparing this church to grow in the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter if this is a small church, if this is a little flock, so be it. But I want everybody, everyone to experience the touch of His power. Say Amen. That you know the Holy Spirit so well. When you walk through that door, you will say to God, Oh God, this is your church. This is your service. Holy Spirit, do not pass me by. Holy Spirit, I pray for my pastor. Holy Spirit, I pray for the worship leader. Holy Spirit, only your word be preached. Reveal yourself. And you can pray to yourself, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me what I must do with my life. Show me, I, you know all my struggles, you know all my pain, you know my shortcomings. Oh, Spirit of God. Oh, Spirit of God. Oh, Spirit of God. Please, please come near me. Reveal Jesus and His glory to me. If you have that prayer, if you have that attitude, if all of us have that attitude, the power in this place will be multiplied many times. Are you hearing me? But many people walk to the door and they will talk and they will be flippant, they will be careless, they will be... The mind is everywhere except with the Holy Ghost. They are not giving Him the reverence. Say Amen. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit is moving people, you know, when a pastor is preaching in some church, he's giving an altar call and the Holy Spirit is moving, people are crying. People start moving in their seats and people going to the washroom and people thinking about many things that they want to do. You say, Pastor, is that wrong? It's not wrong in that sense. It's not a, but there is a lack of reverence, a lack of honoring his ministry, his work in the church. According to the proportion we reverend him and we give him the honor, will be the proportion he will manifest his power in the church. If you fidget, if you are restless, even in the cell group, I always tell people, hey, forget about the food, forget about, you know, 
everything. Just concentrate on the Lord. Just worship Him. Just be there for Him. Say Amen. If you, if you just concentrate on this, you can be touched by Him. But if you are restless, He cannot touch you. If your mind is all over the place, you can hear His voice. You will come through the door and you will leave the door the same. The Holy Spirit, fellowship with the Holy Spirit brings the key. Hallelujah. The second key to the anointing. First anointing is repentance. Second key, fellowship with Him. Fellowship involves four things. What are the four things? Time, effort, engagement, openness. Yes? When you go with the Holy Ghost, one more level, reverence. Reverence and worship and adoration. All right? Number three, the third key to the anointing is obedience to Him. Obeying the Holy Spirit is obeying God. And God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. Now, they were being threatened in Acts chapter 5 not to preach the gospel, but Peter and the other apostles answered in Acts 5.29, says, We ought to obey God rather than men. And see what he said in verse 32, We are His witnesses to these things. So also is the Holy Spirit given to those who obey Him. You must learn to obey His voice. Even the voice may be very gentle. Hello? How many of you want the Holy Spirit? More and more. Feel His power more and more. I'm giving you the key. Come on, take the key. Take the key. Repentance, take the key. Fellowship with the Holy Ghost, take the key. Number three, obedience to the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. And so, let me give you an illustration. Let's say you are watching TV and you're minding yourself that day you are home early. You're sitting on your sofa. You are very happy because your wife cooked you a nice dinner. And it's quite early also at 6 o'clock. Suddenly there's a voice that is prompting. Go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. Pastor said, all the men must finish reading the New Testament by July. Go read your Bible. You feel like, you feel like reading it. Holy Spirit prompt you. Uh, but you ignore it. Let me finish the newspaper first. Huh? So you read the newspaper. Holy Spirit wait for you. After reading the newspaper, the desire reduces. Then let me just watch the news. What's the latest MH 370? You watch. By the time you finish the newspaper, by the time you finish watching the latest news in Banama or MH 370, the desire to read the Bible is gone. Are you hearing me? How many of you have experienced this? When God asks you to do something and you don't do it immediately, the desire less and less and less. Holy Spirit will not force you. Holy Spirit is very gentle. He moves upon you. Holy Spirit touches you and says, come early la, to church. Pastor says, come by 10.15. Have pre-service prayer. You sell it, but you ignore it. Pastor says, everybody must join a cell group. You need to be connected with cell. You ignore it. Holy Spirit whisper to you, son, that show is not good for you. Why, Lord? Alien show. <laughs> the tongue coming out. The devil, is, the devil trying to manifest. <laughs> Never mind, that's just thriller. Watch. You disobey. And after that, I guarantee you, you watch the show, you have no more desire to read the Bible and pray. You cannot pray. How many of you have this experience? But when you obey, when you obey the small little voice, the anointing grows stronger. Who karaba shukar? You feel as your tongue begins restless. Feel as speaking in tongues. Who karaba shukaraba? Obey karaba shuk. The more you obey, the anointing grow. The more you obey, the anointing grow. The more you yield, the anointing grow. That's the key. How many of you want the anointing to grow? Obedience to that voice. Say amen. Praise God. You're getting it. Number four, key to the anointing: spiritual hunger. Oh, I'm going to share this with you. As the deer panted for the waters, so my heart longed after you. We sing the song. That's where they got it. 
My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. King David wrote Psalm 42. He says, When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been full day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? Now, King David loved God so much. Listen, learn. King David has been called the man after God's heart. And then we always wonder why. Even though he committed adultery, he even committed murder, but King David has been called a man after God's heart. Because King David longed after God. He longed to come back and he repent quickly. When his sin was exposed, he repented quickly. And in this psalm, you see what he said. When I remember these things, I pull out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept the feast. King David enjoyed coming to the house of God. He says, I remember how I went. Now he was in, he was, uh, in trial. He was running. He was pursued by the enemy. But he remembered how he came with the multitude, with the house of God, and with the voice of joy and praise. Learn something from King David. King David loved to go to the house of God. So must we say amen. There is a blessing when you enjoy coming to the house of God. He says, oh, how I miss those times. I long for you. Now, as the deer longed after the water brooks, so my heart longed after you. This phrase, this psalm, talk about God is the oasis of water in the midst of a dry land, in the midst of a dry and thirsty land. God is the oasis that satisfies you. When the deer is in the desert or in the mountain, it thirsts and pains for the water brooks. All right? I'm going to bring you a revelation here. The river, the water speaks about the Holy Spirit. The water speaks about the presence of God. And the deer, he says, as the deer panel after the waters. I did a research, a quick research about deer. Deer has very strong legs. And deer has a very compact body. All right, you look at the deer. It's a wonderful animal. And deer have two very strong characteristics. It is a great jumper. It can jump on the Rocky Mountains. It, it, it gallops. The legs are very strong. And deers are very good swimmers. Okay, now, it has been said, when the deer is being pursued by the lion, say the mountain lion, is one of the main enemy, they come and kill the deer, they pursue the deer, the deer would run for its life. In today's modern hunting, there is deer hunting in Australia, in some certain parts of America, deer hunting is legalized, and they will bring hounds, you know what are hounds? Dogs. There are two kinds of hunting dogs. One kind of hunting dogs will be the dogs they can see, sight, and they run very fast. So the dogs will run after the deer and the hunters will follow with their rifles. Okay? That is the base on sight. There is another kind of hound, a dog, that does not follow sight but follows smell, the scent. These hounds don't run as fast as those following the sight. That they are called scent hounds. They chase after the deer based on their sight. They can smell that sight of the deer. It has a smell. And it follows sometimes many miles. You can follow that way the deer, the track of the deer. And they will bring the hunter right to where the deer is. Now, the deer has such a wonderful ability to swim. It has been said that when the deer gets into the river brook and it swims, it loses its smell. And when it loses its smell, the hound cannot find where it is, cannot locate where it is. So this psalm brings that revelation. As the deer panted for the water brooks, it curses for the water when it's in the desert. It looks for the water because when it gets in the water, it's safe. It can swim and it loses its smell. 
I want to show you a video clip how the deer swim. It's only one minute. I found this on YouTube. Reverse backwards. Just to show you how the deer swim very well. Here it is, it's crossing one of the Missouri rivers. See, that's the deer. As the deer panned for the water boots, so my heart longed after you. As the deer pan after the waters, so my heart longed after you. So the deer, see how he swims. He's a great swimmer. Wow, look at that. So you see how the deer can really swim and it really thirsts for water, the water brooks. It's a beautiful illustration of a Christian. If the Christian's life is filled with the Holy Spirit, and as we jump into the river of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God washed over us. The presence of God filled us. Every Tuesday, you people come and, 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 and we come together and we pray. And sometimes we spend two hours praying in the Holy Ghost and we worship. That's the Spirit of God. That's the river of God. As you jump into that river, the river of God covers you and you lose your smell. And the devil cannot find you. Oh, give Jesus a big hand. Oh, hallelujah. Some people say, Dev, Pastor, the devil is after me for the whole week. The, Pastor, the devil is attacking me. Uh, all the things are not happening right in my life. I have got news for you. When you come to worship God, you come to praise God, you do not miss church, you do not miss prayer meeting, you worship God, you think nothing is happening, the devil have you on the radar. He, he has you on the GPS and he can see the green spot and he's trying to align his missile to attack you. He has been planning that missile for three weeks to hit you. But you see, that Tuesday night you come to worship God. You were lost in the spirit and you worship him. Oh, I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. And you go like this. Oh, you go like this. <laughs> Some of you. You worship God. Oh, the spirit of God fills you and you, oh, you enjoy the river. You are like the deer who paddle after the waters. You go into the river and the deer goes into the water brooks and it washes away the sand. And suddenly, the devil wants to look at you and say, Hey, it's gone, it's gone. Hey, it's gone. Oh, it's demon. Hey, it's gone. The floor is gone. He cannot find you. God has a way to protect his people. God has a way to cover you. Oh, somebody says hallelujah. Somebody says praise the Lord. You don't have to worry about the enemy. Hide yourself in his presence. King David says, oh, you hide me in the pavilion of your presence. The worship of God is not a ritual. It's not something ritualistic we do. It's something powerful. When you worship God and you're in the spirit, oh, the spirit of God covers you. You lose your smell. The devil gets confused. His missile, he can launch at you. They that dwell in the presence of the Most High God abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, give Jesus a big hand. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I want to dramatize this and show you the deer getting into the brook. All right? And King David longed to see his power and his glory in another part. He said, I long to see your power and your glory in the sanctuary. He used to come to the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, God's power, the Shekinah glory will come. He said, I long to see your power and your glory in the sanctuary. And so he has this hunger and now he's running for his life. Oh, he remember and he thirsts for that experience again. Really understand that. That was the context that he was writing. So spiritual hunger is another key to the anointing of God. How many of you want the anointing? You say you want the anointing? You got to have spiritual hunger. No hunger, no power. Tell your neighbor, no hunger, no power. No hunger, no future. <laughs> How many of you want to have a future in God? No hunger, no future. Eli. Sometimes, you know, when I fellowship with people and talk to people, I know they have hunger, they have so much hunger. And I know in five years what they will be in God. Some people, no, no hunger. Say, brother, this is a wonderful book. Not referring to my book, lah, any book. Say, this is a good book, you know, good testimony. You want to read? They look at it. They look at it for 30 seconds. They don't need to take. Why? I, I loan it to you, brother. You can read it. When you finish, give it back to me. They were hesitant to take the book because no time to read, pastor. This season very busy. Every time you have to do overtime. Closing account. Whatever. No hunger, no power. No hunger, no future. Say amen. Say, pastor, I know it's good. It's good to read. It's good to have hunger. But I'm not hungry. I know I should be praying, but I'm not praying. I know I should read God's word, but I don't know why I read the newspaper more. I know I should study the word, but I'm not. I know I should pray, I'm not. What must I do? How many of you have this dilemma? <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you. How many of you have this dilemma? I know I should pray, but I'm not. I know I should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto me. I know the scripture, but I'm not seeking it. I'm not praying. I don't know why. I just don't have the desire. Do you know why? There is no spiritual hunger because your heart is full of other things. When your heart is full of other things, you are already full with other things. You have no more hunger for the things of God. Are you hearing me? I say this again. I've said this many times. Many years ago, I had a microwave. I bought a microwave. My dear wife bought a microwave. And she knew my favorite dish was mackerel fish. So one day she said, Honey, Come back early, don't eat dinner outside, come back, I'll cook mackerel fish. And you know, we men sometimes, when wife say something in here, it's okay, 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 out here. And so that day happened, passed by very fast, and about four o'clock, a friend of mine, good Christian friend of mine, a bank manager opposite my office, came over and said, hey, come, let's go for high tea. I said, that sounds good. I'm quite bored in the office. And so I said, let's go. So we went over the road in Jalan Ampang to Nico Hotel, where Citibank is, and we had high tea. And when we had high tea, you know, when you have high tea, you normally eat so many things you normally don't eat because you pay for it. And so they have 100 dishes, cold, hot, salad, mango pudding, sago, whatever, you name it. So I was filled to the brim. I was overflowing. Not with the Holy Spirit, but with food. And I was satisfied and I was happy and I was whistling, you know, taking my briefcase, going to my car. And then I'm going to go home, drive back to Bangsa. So when I reached home, 
when I open the door, I smell macaroffees. And she was busy spreading the table. She always tried to sit as much as possible with me when I eat, even though she has eaten. She set the table, put the thing down, and she put the fork and spoon, was busy with everything. And my, I was staring at the mackerel fish. But my hands were not moving. And I just can't find the words to say, I have eaten. Because I see she had put in so much effort. I just didn't have the heart to say, I've eaten. And when she saw my hand was not moving, she said, why don't you eat? Why are you not eating? Oh my goodness. I cannot eat anymore because I was already full. Yes or no? See, when you are, the moral of the story is, when you are full of other things, when you are full of other things, you have no more hunger for God. How many of you want the hunger to return? You say you want the anointing? How many of you still want the anointing? You still want the power. You still want the power. You want your life to affect others. You influence others for godliness and for Jesus Christ. You want the power. Take the rubbish out. When you take the rubbish out, the spiritual hunger will return. Say Amen. You've got to take time to take the rubbish out. Get on your knees one hour and say, God, I repent. My business has become number one. My clients have become number one. Money has become number one. My job has become number one. The fear of my boss has become number one. And you stay there. It won't work for you in just 30 seconds. You stay there in the place of prayer and you stay there on your knees and say, Oh God, help me. I repent. There's something, Lord, I must repent. Pastors have been talking about repentance. And you are not number one in my life. And I know it and you know it, God. I must repent. Now, when you do that and you mean it with your heart, the power of the Holy Ghost will come and He takes that out of you. You may, I'm not saying you resign from your job. I'm not saying, David, you close your business. I'm not saying you quit. I'm not saying you, 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 you disrespect your boss. But something happens in your heart. Your heart is now set on God. Say amen. You may still have to work. Yes, but your heart is set on God. And Jesus gets promoted to be number one. Hallelujah. Take the rubbish out. If you want spiritual hunger, it's simple. Take the rubbish out and the hunger will return. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, I give you my business. Lord, I give you my children. Lord, I give you. People ask me, how you find a passion? How you find a passion to pastor the church? Go on 40 missions. Every year on two or three missions. You have a business to run. Some of the clients are big clients. I say, it's easy. I learn how to apply the brake. When it comes to Tuesday, I say, even you are Dato, you are Tansri, I don't care who you are, my church comes first. The cell meeting comes first. Even the cell is only two people. I learned when I was just starting before I pastored the church. I was asked to lead in a cell group. And the cell group was in Cheras. My pastor says, you are an old Christian, Francis, and you can help some young Christians there in Cheras. I say, oh, all right. My son was a baby, and me and my wife, just the first son, baby, we carried the baby in a car. And I remember a few occasions where a very important client, a VIP client, to say, I want, to come in, I want you to come over to my office at 6 o'clock. He's a doctor, corporate guy, and people will lose money, purposely lose money to play golf just to be with him. They play golf with him, purposely lose to make him happy. And he says, hey, I want to see you. Can you just come up over to my office? And he says, I can't. Can you imagine? He says, He's the chairman of a bank. And he says, I can't. What do you mean you can't? He's so used to people coming, calling, you come. They come. And he says, I can't, sir. He says, I can't today. But if any time tomorrow, day after, I can. I can go to your, I have something on this evening. 
But you know, to my amazement, it's still all right. God still back you up. God still give you the favor. Say amen. But if you say, when I'm free, only I come la, for self. When I'm free, only I come to church. La. When I'm free, first la. You will never be free because the devil will make sure you always have a distraction. Are you hearing me? You've got to learn to put God first. You've got to tell your boss, no, I can't. And see whether you will lose your job. If God is God, see whether you will lose your job. If you lose your job, it doesn't matter. God will give you a new one. Oh, you miss a good place. <laughs> hey, amen. People, if you believe that God can give you eternal life and God can take you to heaven, you cannot believe that God will give you another client and another job. Even if you lose that, it's about time you stand up and not be intimidated. It's about time you stand up and not be intimidated by the devil and the circumstances of your life and make Jesus number one. Somebody says amen. Somebody says praise the Lord. Somebody says hallelujah. Say this with me. No power, no, no hunger, no power. No hunger, no future. How many of you, how many of us here want a future in God? I got news for you. You have no future in this world. Say what, pastor? This world is in decay. This world is getting evil by the day. This world will suffer the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Though we are in this world, we are not of this world. There is no future in this world. But there is a future for you and me in God. You miss a good place to say amen. Come on, give Jesus a big, big hand. Shout glory, somebody. Shout hallelujah, somebody. My future is in God. How many of you believe? I believe it with all my heart. There is no future for me in this world. Look at this world. Look at the decay, the corruption, the flesh. Even if you have all the glamour and all the wealth, oh man, oh sinner man, where will you run to? Oh sinner man, the song says, where will you run to on that day? Oh sinner man, where will you go to? There is no future. But God has given us a glorious future in Him. Our future is in Him. Are you understanding me? Our future is in Him. So what is the future, Pastor? What is the future? You will live forever. And forever. <laughs> and forever. And forever. And forever. And forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. Oh, so glory. Because he lives, I will live also. That's our future. The world is passing away. But because we are in him. Listen to me. When we get to heaven, don't think heaven, I'm deviating from this, I can't finish all the ten, I'm closing. When we get to heaven, not all of us will be the same. The Bible talks about God will give not only rewards, but responsibilities and tasks. Some will be tasked over ten planets. Some will be tasked for five stars, three stars. In the heavens, we will reign with God. According to our faithfulness, according to our spiritual development and our growth in this earth, so will we be assigned the position and recognition and responsibilities in the heaven. Our future is great. Our future is in God. Brother, there is no future for you in this world. You think you have a future, it's only 70 years and it's gone. 
You gave all your life for the 70 years to live for this world. It will be over very soon. But for eternity, we will reign and rule with Him. That's my future. <laughs> oh, give Jesus. Come on, somebody. Stand to your feet and shout hallelujah. Stand to your feet and praise God. Hallelujah.